Hello and welcome to Insight, a show where we have courageous conversations about social justice and the issues affecting the citizens of the region of Peel and beyond. I'm one of your hosts, David Barnwell, and I'd like to present an idea to you. Picture yourself in a beautiful theater, stone walls, tile floor, the crowd is chit-chatting away and the lights dim. It's time to go in and enjoy the show. Even at the community theater level, tickets aren't that expensive, maybe around $25 to $30. But for parents who are trying to bring their young children out to inspire and educate them about the arts, that can prove quite expensive. But on the flip side, what if you're an amateur artist seeking for an outlet to show off your craft or even to meet with like-minded individuals and learn how you can better yourself or pursue a career. That's what we're here to talk about tonight and that's access to the arts. We're joined with three of Insight's hosts, Ranjit, Dave and Ann Chow, as well as a special guest Natalia from Night and Day to share her authentic story. Welcome everyone. Fantastic to have you here, Natalia. Thank you for coming. And I know that um, Night and Day Studio does a, a phenomenal job with getting out to students, to adults, to the community at a very, very reasonable rate. And sometimes a lot of free activities too, right, that they can get, that yeah. they can join in. Absolutely. Can you share some of those with us? Tell us how you do that and tell us a little bit about Night and Day to start off with. Uh, so Night and Day Studios is a uh, beautiful uh, studio in the it's in the industrial area in Brampton. Uh, it's 100% uh, made from recycled materials. Um, it's got like a beautiful little bridge inside. Um, uh, access for people to come in and do arts um, at a pay what you can um, level. Um, how we do this is we are what we like to call an intentional community. Um, we get together as uh, a whole to, uh, together um, to be able to um, access arts um, on a professional level, on um, a community level, which is one of the most important things to us, and um, to help uh, people who might not have the same access to um, paying $25 in art class uh, to be able to do those things as well. Um, I know as a child, for me, um, my parents didn't have the access to be able to send me to whatever classes I wanted, all this stuff. So um, my intentions are to hopefully help Night and Day Studios like, accomplish that, um, give, give a place for uh, the person who might not have that extra money to put their child into some, uh, you know, just even a class to come and draw. Um, so uh, and you have those art classes yeah we um, do. and you post them up on facebook page yeah we post them on facebook i mean like facebook is the place to go these days to find out any information really right. um uh, so uh, we use that social media as a uh, great function it's a great free access to marketing really mm -hmm. that's the way we look at it at night and day studios um so every day there has to be some form of uh, marketing going on um we do also um all access uh, events at our space as well, uh, where we have dry events, which means no drugs, no alcohol. Um, it is uh, functional for families, for um, uh, teenagers uh, it, between those ages of like uh, going to the club and not going to the club, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Um, and it gives them a place to be where they are safe. Um, they get access to uh, local music. Um, local artists as well and local literature as well because mm -hmm. um, we are trying to uh, put in a nice literary section to Night and Day Studios as well. So Can say, I? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so you, say you offer services for professionals. What types of services would someone be able to get? Um, okay, so services for professionals at Night and Day Studios would be access to having um, a place to practice uh, specifically for bands. Um, we have evenings available where a band could come if they need a place to practice for a show um, and we try to give them like a nice you know a pay, a pay what you can kind of thing as well um, usually you know uh, a band will come in and each each member will pay maybe five dollars they can come in they can practice for the night we don't give them a time that they need to leave or anything like that um, 
and then we just give them the space to be able to create. Because a lot of the time, I think those little things, like a, a place to be able to create your music, is is the the wall that that keeps them from moving forward a little bit. So if they want to go on a professional level, we kind of take that little wall out of there. So we can't afford seventy dollars an hour to go rent a space, or we can't afford five hundred dollars a month to rent a space. We sure can't afford like maybe once a week like twenty bucks to come and like use the space. That twenty dollars goes back into the space as well. That's what we try to do with it. Uh, we're grassroots at this moment, so it's more of like a social enterprise, and uh, we take the money back in and put it right back into the studio. Whether it goes to paint for the paint station for events, um, uh, we're trying to integrate like uh, we have like a tuck shop during events too, where we sell food. Uh, we would like to integrate healthier things rather than just chips and pop, which is usually what you get. Um, uh, but we would like to make it a healthier place as well. Because as, as many of you know, uh, we try to remain more on the vegetarian or vegan side as well. Yeah. Excellent. So, <clears throat> sorry, we're hearing about all the wonderful things that Night and Day Studio provides to the community. You're a working artist yourself yeah. um, who's built a career on art. Can you walk us through what the struggles were in order to build that career and, and the lack of accessibility that you have even to this day being a professional artist. Um, I think lack of accessibility is sometimes, especially as a visual artist, you just like start getting a little bit bigger and bigger when you'd like to make like a bigger uh, canvas. You need to have the space to put the canvas in so that you can paint. Yeah. Um, I find that that is a lot of the time the, the, the access point is um, having enough of those commissions to be able to pay for that $200 a month studio. Uh, that, like, I think that initial step is always, like, the, one of the bigger steps that is, like, um, uh, makes access a little bit less. Um, just, like, if I want to, if I get a commission for, like, a huge piece, but I don't have a place to paint it, that's a big wall that is not going to be able to get me that commission that I need to be able to go forward. Right. Well, like you folks did when you did the, what was it, nine foot by six foot backdrop yeah. for this show. Yeah. Um, and that came from, you know, from night and day. Studio. And it came from your, <laughs> your artists coming together and saying, look, what do you need? What do you want? What images? What's the thought? What's the idea? And that's where it came from, yeah. right? It's producing that piece. It was huge and absolutely fantastic. And, uh, and it came out of the vision um, that some of you artists were able to sit down and say, well, what is it you're looking for, Ranjit? Then how do we make this happen, right? And, and you made it happen for us. So, and having that space, where else could you have that? You couldn't get that in my house, no. right? And, and <laughs> no, where it's, it's do you great. get it's it like in? nine by six feet. Right? Yeah. And so that's why in your place in, in the studio, yeah. um, you have the space, you can make it happen. Um, and you've got a lot of artwork up there. So a lot of artists come there, they create the work, and then they exhibit them. Yeah, right? we have uh, exhibit space. Uh, we have a beautiful gallery in the front end of our, uh, of our uh, studio. studio there. And uh, we have a wonderful studio in the back where like paint can be thrown and there's wonderful murals and all that stuff. Um, and all of that stuff wouldn't, wouldn't be there if uh, we didn't actually go out and do the recycling that you're kind of talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things is uh, we have members who are uh, expert recyclers and uh, uh, repurposers um, of materials, uh, which I think is important in art at this point at this point in time. Um, just because uh, we don't want to, uh, our intentional community uh, tries to also environmentally be um, accessing things that are not going to. Um, affect our environment as much. Right. Uh, canvases, they, they use a lot of wood. Um, and there's a lot of wood just hanging out out there, really. Um, one of the things that uh, we started to do was a series of paintings that are repurposed on, um, on pallet wood. Mm -hmm. And it's just sanded down pallet wood and then yep. used as a canvas. Well, look at your floor. Yeah. Right? It's all <laughs> tiled, yeah. right? So I'm, I'm thinking of the floor and I'm thinking... In the it, gallery? What, yeah. yeah. It's absolutely that phenomenal. That the artists have built themselves. Yeah. 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 That was... Just tiles all smashed up yeah. and then recreated yeah. into patterns that have come out of, you know... It's the, like a $10,000 floor, like, 
uh, just collected pieces over a couple of years and yeah. then like thrown down by two artists, two very great artists, uh, Jeremy, uh, who is the founder, and uh, and uh, Kevin, who also was uh, working, a, a, yeah, was working yeah. there and yeah. a, a great asset to our, te our team and community. Right. So when, when you look at all the stuff that you're doing, um, everything is accessible, right? And so when we talk about art not being accessible, it's not your art that's not accessible. Mm. It's things like, like for me, with my children, when you know, we were looking at art and giving them the art experience, it was operas, it was you know, orchestras, it was symphonies, it was um, ballet, it was a whole ton of stuff that we were Taking reluctant to go to. piano lessons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, piano lessons. And it was, you know, how do we find the money every time we go to spend $400 for four people so in order to make it a family experience, it was often you know, not within our budget. Yeah, or it absolutely. wasn't money that we could rightfully say we can afford to do this with. And, and what excites me is how night and day have managed to include children, yeah. right? Include different artists. So we're talking about musicians. We're talking about visual artists. We're talking about just the artist's mm -hmm. mind you know, is to bring it to the floor bring it to the walls, bring it to to um, get out there and create new images and new experiences for children and adults. Absolutely. I would love to see through Night and Day Studios come a little bit more of the uh, like performance arts type of things. Like I want to see some puppet shows, you know, like some puppet yeah. shows or like anything like that. And any, I think anybody out there who is looking for a place where um, their their creation is going to come to life. I think Night and Day Studios is a great place to start out, mm -hmm. and uh, come just come there. You know, like I think uh, any and any age too. I don't. It doesn't matter how old you are. I think what we've tried to really do at Night and Day Studios is close that age gap. You know, we have a wonderful mentor. His name is Silver Elvis, and uh, you know he comes from like Zoomers Fest and whatever else, and we close that gap by making sure that we have people who are coming from different parts of life as well. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to successfully do that? Because I know a lot of arts organizations out there are struggling with the idea of the convergence of ages. How, how, were, how was Night and Day able to do that? I think we just came, we've come up across the right people, <laughs> yeah. really, when it comes down to it. Um, uh, like our, the one mentor that I was mentioning, he's been in uh, performing arts for a very long time. Uh, he, he knows uh, buskering as well and uh, we you know uh, the connections happen between the people that are there who uh, want to see our community strive uh, we want to have opportunities for our artists that are gonna one uh, take their art career and make it a career yeah right and two, uh, make sure that they are able to live which is I think one of the hardest things to do with an art career is like take your art career and make sure that you're able to like have a living wage. Have a living wage. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think through us getting together like that, um, that's how we find it. Networking is important. Yeah. But I have to say that 100 percent. Networking is important. I think from from my perspective, what I see is uh, a gap in being able to access funds. Um, you know, there's so much money out there that can be accessed and, and yet uh, night and day haven't been able to do that yet. Yeah. So if we were going to do a call out, you know, for, for support in order for you to be able to access some of those funds because of the work that you do for young artists, yeah. for young people in the community um, and the work that you do to bring the community together, um, what would be that, that call out that we would do in order to help you? For the like for for like grants Access. and uh, like mm -hmm. and just donate donate like donations wise I guess if you want to call it that we're yeah. not a not for profit organization so I don't really but uh, um, I mean the the call up would just be like please come and attend our events um, bring people like that that it in that grassroots area the pay what you want it only works if people come out really when you look at it. But like volume is way more important to me than, uh, and way more important to Night and Day Studios than, than the, the amount really when it comes down to it. Right. I want people to come and I want people to see the community aspect of it. 
So if you had one wish and you said, okay, this is where we'd like to go, what would that look like? Um, I think that uh, for Night and Day Studios, that would be uh, just making sure that all of those things continuously start to grow. Um, please come attend our workshops. They are pay, as pay, pay what you want. Um, uh, so you come in uh, on thir Thursdays and Sundays. We already have a pay workshop, um, which is pay what you can afford. And the teacher, uh, his name is Maxim Grunin, and Maxim is an amazing art teacher. He's a master. Um, and you get to come and learn with him. For and not just a master artist. He actually has a master's in art. Yeah, yeah. he is a master's in art artist. You know, and like he did our things. family portrait. He and did. it was fantastic. <laughs> he did your family portrait, and he did yeah. this lovely background that is this absolutely. Right here absolutely. Right. And every time, every time I walk down our stairs, I look at it and smile. <laughs> Yeah. So, and it's the work of people like that that make that happen, right? Yeah. So, and it's how do you bring these people in and how do you make it happen and how do you access the support that you need? So our key message then today is to make sure that uh, we, we ensure that people actually attend all of your events that yeah, you have. Please come and attend. So if we're Where looking Where can they at, find you? So in Brampton, we are at 18 Strathern Avenue, unit 12C North. If you can't find it, you can call um, our phone number, which is 647-302-7235. And uh, during events, uh, somebody will pick up the phone for sure and like let you know where we are. Um, uh, come and visit us on Thursdays and Sundays. We have a workshop. It starts at 7.30 and it goes till about 10 o'clock. Um, yeah. Thank that's, you that's so much for joining us today. No Thank you so and much for having me on here. We're so blessed to have Thank you here. You. <laughs> I mean, it's exciting for me because I want more and more youngsters to actually get involved with arts. Yeah. So thank you for joining us and we're going to be straight back after Play Matters. <laughs> Welcome to Play Matters. Arts and Recreation serve multiple purposes in a child's healthy development such as motor skills, brain development, and stress management. Arts and recreation can include anything from drama and visual arts to dance, playing an instrument, playing outside, and cooking. It is something that is controlled by the child and their energy is put into an activity which allows them to create something meaningful for them. A child's ability to participate in arts and recreational activities can sometimes be limited by family income. Children who live in poverty are less likely to be ex exposed to quality recreational experiences. One thing that everyone is exposed to is nature and the outdoors. This can be used as a form of recreation. Experiences with nature have many benefits to a child's development and well-being, including physical development, brain development through exploration, exploring with their sen senses, attention and focus, controlling emotions. You may visit community centers and re for night, wow. You may visit community parks and nature or recreational programs for kids such as the Humber Arboretum, Algonquin Park, High Park, and community centers with free programming. A few ideas for incorporating nature into your child's play include scavenger hunt outdoors. Here's a map that we created that is relatively close to us. However, you can create one with your child that represents the things in your community. Or you can do a bingo. You can check off as you go when you find things outside. Uh, you can also go snowshoeing, skating, swimming, hiking, rock climbing. Bird watching, cloud watching, or even sports, outdoor sports. Painting or making artwork with nature by using sticks, stones, pine cones, etc. We have some materials here that we found outside that you can demonstrate with your child how to use them. So this activity will allow your children to enhance their muscle development, um, imagination skills, and cognitive development. You can take this activity further by teaching your child about color mixing. And it's important to ask your child questions while they're creating their artwork so they can demonstrate their thought process to you. So, so grab a stick, Zara. Find your paint. It's super easy. It's not something that you want to overthink, right? So you can, your child can demonstrate the different strokes that the different sticks or the different objects make, the different imprints that different types of leaves might leave. Um, on the paper and then you can even demonstrate color mixing so by col um, mixing together different colors. So green and uh, blue would make just like the turquoise color 
and mixing orange and blue makes a really <laughs> ugly gray. <laughs> But painting with something that other than the paintbrush gives your child a different opportunity to feel different mediums. Everything has a different texture and just makes the painting more fun and not boring. Welcome back to Insight. Our show today is on access to arts. And we're in the segment that really looks at field experience and what's happening in the arts. We have two amazing people here today. Chuck and Leo, and both of them are involved in at the city level in terms of arts and the field of arts, and they're going to share their journeys with us. And uh, Chuck, maybe you could start um, and tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll pass it over to Leo. So in my profession, I'm a, a film and television producer, director, but uh, in the, at the community level, um, I've been a volunteer in the arts for over 25 years. Uh, I'm involved with PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archive. Right now I'm chair of the, the board there and uh, have been involved in that for a long, long time. Um, I'm also, uh, we are just creating in Brampton an arts and culture panel to look at the strategic direction that the arts in Brampton are taking and seeing uh, better ways that we can create an economic driver in the community using arts as, as one of those uh, methods. So I'm, I'm going to head up that panel. Um, it's, a, it's just been approved by council, and uh, we start work right away, and, and over the next eight to ten months, we'll be coming up with a strategic plan. It's a, there's 19 people from the community representing all ages and uh, cultures, people from all sorts of arts backgrounds, film, television, uh, which I come from, uh, but people from dance, from theater, from music, uh, from literature, so it's, it's uh, from fine arts of all kinds. So it, it's representing the whole of the city and from all areas in the city, from across the city. So we hope to come up with a plan that will help Brampton and, and move forward in the future with uh, a stronger arts presence in the city. Perfect, thank you. So Leo, tell us a little bit about yourself as well, please. Well, I'm a, a part-time artist. I'm a struggling artist, so I, I understand that component to it. But I just recently became one of the directors for a Canadian Community Arts Initiative which uh, um, does uh, uh, South Asian, the TD uh, Mosaic Festival. And uh, it's- Actually the largest South Asian festival. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> in the world. And it's free. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> and it's hosted and, right here in mm -hmm. Mississauga. Celebration Square, yep. yeah. So I'm honored to be part of that. And I, I'm one of the art directors and I, we create uh, uh, access to visual arts through the Promenade Gallery and, uh, and promote uh, community engagement through the, through the gallery also. Mm -hmm. um, another a component is uh, MISA, which is the South Asian uh, uh, Film Festival that yep. uh, we also create. And look, moving forward, I think in two, so 2017, uh, we're uh, trying to create a vision for uh, a, a biannual in, in the GTA yep. um, and with a focus on, on the region, trying to make it uh, a viable uh, option to uh, to host, uh, you know, an international scale uh, biannual. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of. So what what would that include? What would that look like? Um, it it's in the in the process of, of being sort of explored, um, and it all depends on uh, obviously uh, uh, grants and funding because we're a nonprofit and and most of our uh, funding comes from from grants, federal and, and provincial, mm -hmm. the Trillium Foundation and that that, that sort of thing. Uh, and that's where a lot of the money seems to be right now, uh, is you know exploring avenues to involve youth, and making uh, sure that the youth are actively involved in those grassroots works um, that engage them, uh, and you know making it happen for them. It seems um, that there are these avenues, but as artists, often we're not able to access those funds as readily as we'd like. So share, share with me some of the barriers uh, for artists to be able to um, access those funds. Okay, I, I, from um, I think an artist's perspective, I see that uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of programs and, and nonprofits uh, like um, Visual Arts Mississauga, there's all these different um, organizations providing the arts, but they're membership driven um, any event they kind of hold classes or, or festivals or um, outdoor exhibitions, there's always fees attached to it. And so 
I think as, as an individual that may be uh, financially struggling, it's, it's, it's a huge barrier. Well, to especially when we're looking, at, um, we're looking at poverty and growing number of people, especially in Peel, that live below the poverty line, you know, how can we make uh, drive arts into a place where everybody can access it? And it seems like night and day have that opportunity to make it pay what you can. Um, is that something that we can do realistically in Peel for any of the artist opportunities? Do you see that happening? Do you oh, see absolutely. That? I think there's, uh, there's, there, you mentioned it before, there's money there. It's just uh, being able to um, coordinate that with uh, municipal level and provincial levels to, to really just uh, provide those spaces, provide the, the programs. Um, maybe it could be even just uh, structural programs on how to, um, how to write a grant. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that uh, some artists struggle with and why not offer uh, workshops and we, we did actually did that uh, uh, a lot for the last uh, few years mm -hmm. in at the promenade gallery we right. it was an open door door type of uh, idea and it was it was about community engagement we we offered a lot of uh, just workshops on on different venues um, we had um, um, Muslims actually came in and did a great talk on, on the barriers uh, that they're facing. And we, we introduced sort of a creative component where we had um, guests come in and, and write on the walls what their aspirations were. And it was just a, you know, a, a slightly bit, bit uh, different creative process. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we were talking about this really sort of uh, timely and current issues that are, everyone faces in terms of uh, barriers, not just artists, but just in, in, in that um, as, as community uh, building and, and sort of building bridges type mm -hmm. of thing, right? Mm -hmm. I want to look at the, um, the other side of Peel right now and go back to this council that you're, you're a part of and assembling. What barriers are you guys finding when, when this collective has come together? Well, one of the things we're going to try to do is look at best practices. Okay. Um, the Br Brampton had an arts council up until about a year ago. Um, it was closed down due to a lack of funding. And they did provide some of the services you talked about, grant writing, uh, people teaching artists how to use social media, teaching artists how to use market themselves to create stronger portfolios. So we had senior artists come in and talk about how to prepare a por portfolio and things like that. Um, we'll hopefully be offering some of those again. And those were all free services to artists. Um, I think what, what has to happen in the future is we have to look at the funding models and say, how do we take care of at-risk youth? How do we take mm -hmm. care of okay. families below the poverty line? How right. do we service them within what we do, whether it's the, a theater like the Rose Theater in Brampton that does different types of performances, or, or it's PAMA. I mean, we've tr tried to, for example, with Sick Heritage Month that's going on right now, um, it, the general admission's free for, right. for everyone. And yeah. we found sponsors. Um, not, and not only in, in the sick community, but across our, our communities. Um, you know, there's people from law offices and, and banks and that that put money in to, to make sure that, that people could come for free so that it opened up access to everybody within the community. Mm -hmm. And particularly with a cross-cultural show like that, you want to be able to bring everybody in and share in the joy of, the, of that heritage and that history. Because we are multidisciplinary art archives and a museum, we, we yeah. cross barriers. Um, but I, I think that the thing that we have to look forward uh, going forward is how do we create things that aren't totally driven by the money from the city? Because yeah. the city can't fund any everything mm -hmm. fully funded. So we have to look at those other opportunities, whether they're federal or provincial for other money. But how can artists generate money in terms of working with sponsors, working with yeah. you know, programs within banks? Because there are programs with it's just finding the ways to access them. And I think that one of the problems we as artists have is in access assessing it. In the film business, all of our shows are, are, are multi, uh, you know, financed through multi different yes. organizations. There's broadcasters, there's distributors, but there, and then there's tax credit money. Um, sometimes there's international co-productions where you've got two or three broadcasters and we have uh, tax credit funding from different organizations in maybe the UK and Canada. So they're quite complex financing structures. Now, of course, we deal with much larger budgets in yeah. In, in, in the film business. But I think things like that can apply to the world of art. We have a show right now as part of the Sea Carriage Month, um, the Sing Twins, and that we found um, 
levels of financing for that across both multiple Britain and platforms. Canada, so multiple yeah. platforms. So mm -hmm. I think that's one way to do it. And and you know it is you have to if if you're running an institution like PAMA, we have to figure out ways to make it accessible to people who can't can't afford it. And and so we do some programs where we you know uh, do outreach to to groups uh, that are that are in fragile states. So and I think we w we were saying one thing, and that was. If you can't afford it, but you really want to go, go anyway and ask and say, this is where we're at. Is there any way that you can help? And, and I think like anywhere, there's always exceptions, right? But it's how do we make it so that those exceptions are public, but not so that everybody then takes advantage of it? You know what I mean? Like it, it's a fine line almost. I, I think if anyone's willing to ask and say, you know, I can't afford to come and, yeah. and take part in this, but I really would like to. I'm involved in another uh, organization called Rain Dance Canada. Mm -hmm. Rain Dance uh, teaches people film and television uh, and f you know, techniques and, and that. We run a number of different programs. Um, you know, we, we're an organization that runs on the edge all the time financially, mm -hmm. so a lot of us give a lot of time for free. And, and yeah. so volunteer, finding volunteers in a position that, that they can, in my case, teach uh, I teach some documentary programs and some script writing programs. Um, it, it's, it's one way to get it. And we can make it ac accessible at a very low cost compared to you know, taking a course at, at a university or a college. I think my, my issue was um, with, for example, the arts panel. Uh, we knew that there was an arts council. It dissipated for some reason, and now it's sort of coming back to life again with a panel that may end up becoming another council or may not. But um, as a panel, how do we get to a place where we go beyond the tokenism? Um, and, and my hang up is that we have all these committees all over the city, and that's Mrs. Arger and Brampton, and they set up and it makes somebody look good, and they do nothing. But it's up there, this is existing. Um, how do we make sure that this arts panel isn't just a tokenistic council strategy to um, have the, the appearance of it doing something and not do anything? So <laughs> again, we, we haven't had our first meeting and I don't want to, as the, you know, the, the token chair, I don't want to, I don't, I, I, I don't want to put, put my, put my um, you know, I don't want to put too much into it, but I think we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at what is the city of Brampton currently doing right. and how are they spending their, their money in arts and culture. And then two, we're going to look at, a, we're the ninth largest city in Canada. What are the other cities that are, that are you know, eight, seven, six, and nine, or 10, ten 11, 11, 12? Yeah. What are they doing? And what are, what are, the, where, what are the, 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 the gold standard? What are the cities that are doing the best work? And what, are the, right. what is their governance model? So if we can look at those two things and then say, how, now, we've seen how we do it. We see how everybody else does it. Now, what's the model that need, we need to create for Brampton? I you know, know the, important, sorry, the important talk right now is dollars per capita, that a lot of arts, um, culture divisions, uh, provincial, municipal governments are looking at is allocating a certain dollar per person in their city to develop their arts budget or their culture budget. How do you see that working in a region like Peel that, um, you know, again, as you said, shut down due to lack of funding? How do we not repeat that same, same mistake? So it's, it's interesting. When you say, do, do, you know, a, a dollar per person yeah. or a, a price per person, the question is, how is that money spent? Yeah. You know, if that's just spent to build up, you know, you know greater more municipal employees, more, you know, that sort of thing, then, then that's not money well spent. So yeah. I, I like to think of it as, as money. What is that investment and, and what, what money does that investment, that seed investment, how can it create other capital? So how, how can, you know, we, we have an organization called Lab B in Brampton. They were given a little bit of seed money from the city. They yeah. got up and running. They got a little bit of money from some donors that came in and sponsored them. And now they've got a, a trillion grant for $300,000 to give them a kickoff which will really give them a three-year run to, to, to turn that business into something. Yeah. And they are helping at-risk risk youth with arts projects. They're helping them with you know, business op openings. They're, they're, doing a, they're, they're involving technology in, in what they're doing. So it's, it's a really great organization, and it's driven by two young gentlemen who are yeah. 
fantastically enthusiastic and want to make Brampton a better place. And they want to stay in Brampton. I th I th and, and we know that we've got a lot of artists. And we know that they're here in Peel. And we know that they're excited and motivated and inspired. How do we bring that voice to the table in order to help guide the direction that we go in so it isn't a token. And I know both of you are really committed and passionate about arts, and I know you do an amazing job. But I'm throwing it out there to make sure that we think about how we bring those children to the table and how we bring those youth to the table. Leo, your last thoughts about how we do that. Sure, um, I think to look at different models of, uh, of engagement. So there's, uh, co-ops that can, can sort of start developing um, art collectives. So artists just, and we saw a perfect example of Night and Day Studios with absolutely zero um, capital and they're, they're, they're thriving as, and their, their capital is their creative capital. And, and that has so much value to adding culture and uh, in, in the arts in, in, our, in our lives, right? It enriches our lives and our, our culture. Mm -hmm. So that, that needs to translate into, into monetary um, value for them so they can, they can exist. But Thank I think you. pulling those resources together and opening up a studio as a collective is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo. So your key message? I think we have to recognize that arts is an economic driver in a community. In, in Ontario, it is 10 times what, what uh, sports is in terms of creating economic um, mm -hmm. growth. People go to art galleries, they go to, out for dinner, they go to a bar, they go to a coffee shop, they go to talk about it, they go to a movie, the same thing. So if we can create the, the understanding that arts drives other financial gains, I think that that way, and, and we as artists don't do that well. We don't sell the fact that we actually create jobs and we create community. And I think those are the two things to talk about. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it certainly spurred a lot of dialogue and I'm looking forward to seeing both of you in different ways contributing, you already are, but contributing to bringing youth to the table and becoming involved more and more. And I know that it's going to grow, so thank you for being here. So our um, key message is, let's attend every function that you can in Peel that's to do with the arts to empower our youth and our artist world here and we'll see you right back after we enjoy our artist who's going to be on right now.
Insight, our show on access to arts. We have two phenomenal guests here with us today. So Sean and Peter, welcome. Thank uh, and thank you for being here. And both of you have contributed so much to the field of arts, and I thank you for doing that. Um, if you could share with us, Peter, can you start by telling us how you've made art accessible and how you've contributed to it? Um, I, I worked a lot in, in television and film for quite a while. And then I, I uh, and in art galleries, and then I realized that uh, audiences, uh, I, it was the niche markets I was I was actually uh, in, and the general public wasn't seeing enough of uh, close up or process of art, and uh, so I uh, ended up performing as a street performer. Mm -hmm. I, I study, I got a scholarship to study in New York street performing, if you can imagine. It. <laughs> but uh, I finally put it to use uh, after I trained there. And um, uh, as soon as I started performing on the street, it was uh, unexpected. Audiences were turning around the corner, and all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, it's a living statue, it's a character, it's theatrical, it's a mask, it's got makeup involved in it, mime, dance, uh, and music. And so it's spontaneous art. So it's bringing it to the small families, to elderly, to the uh, um, to even um, people that are uh, out of the hospital, just getting out, released out of the hospital, or walking, and street people, just mm -hmm. normal street people. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a, a street performer, I decided to bring theater onto the street and uh, see how I can manipulate it. And as soon as I did, within two weeks of performing, I got an offer to tour nationally across Canada, uh, and then international after that. So. Uh, you would think street performing, you, you, you know, as long as I, I, I did have training coming into it, I must admit, and I did leave the television world to perform live. Mm -hmm. And so I left the art galleries to uh, bring art onto the street. So I work with mural artists now from night and day. I formed uh, uh, an alliance with their uh, grassroots organization to bring uh, legal wall uh, graffiti to the city. Uh, also in Toronto, so they're they're not just being in Brampton; they're moving out into other uh, regions. So it's good that you're out of your comfort zone and, and uh, trying other areas to be recognized. Uh, there's more chances of opportunity, I find. 
Now, you were Silver Elvis mm -hmm. at the um, <laughs> art battle. That's right. Uh, and I have to say, I had to look twice. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that Peter? Yeah. yeah uh, you were fantastic. Yeah. And it was really well, lovely I, to see. I work a lot in mask. I've uh, uh, been a mask maker for uh, 30 years and um, made over a thousand masks. I got intrigued with masks because it, the role playing that you can play with it. Uh, also, it's a great uh, dovetail to the mime work that I was doing in physical theater. So using the combination of mask and physical theater with mm -hmm. dance, it, uh, it's a great, powerful tool, uh, and it's uh, universally accepted uh, around the world. And I, you could almost use it as a form of therapy for children as well. Yeah, right? uh, anything, uh, anything to keep the kids off the machines uh, mm. and moving in their bodies <laughs> from, their neck, <laughs> like that. from their neck down yeah. uh, is, is very therapeutic and brings them back to their human state right. and into their intuitive faculties. Right. So, Sean, your experience, what, t tell us a little bit more, and I know that you're from here, from yes. Peel, yes. and uh, share with us your experiences. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, my experience really began as a child, and I, I, I mentioned this when we were speaking earlier, but um, I, I grew up as an artist, and I grew up um, really wanting to know how to sew and, and to kind of um, to learn how to draw and to paint, so my parents let me... Uh, draw on my walls and I asked my mom to teach me how to sew so I kind of started at a really early age and um, I think like everyone I kind of was diverted a little bit into um, the stereotypical directions that um, young people may go in university and, and into the banking job and luckily I've kind of come full circle and come back to what um, what my grassroots are and what I believe to be my true passion and then it's you know, it's made me happy every day to wake up and, and do what I do now, which is effectively uh, on the fashion side of things and more so moving into the art as well. So um, that's kind of what my experience is. It has been and um, hopefully uh, more and more um, as the future comes, it will be, um, there'll be more experience that I'll, that I'll be able to uh, to put into that as well. So, but it's interesting when you you talk about uh, your parents allowing you to paint on the walls, and I'm having a heart attack. My heart's palpitating, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what? And I know that for my children, I would have slapped their wrists and said, "Stop it! You do not do that." So, how do you get parents to to nurture that sort of relationship? They must have been angels. They mm. well, they are. Angels, <laughs> I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's it's really just a matter of um, being able to nurture whatever your child's passion is yeah. and um, and give them that opportunity to be able to do it. And, and in my case, um, I didn't necessarily come from you know the most wealthy or or well-to-do family. So uh, my canvas was was my white wall, or sorry, were my white walls in, in my bedroom. And um, I guess that's just uh, that's just what they were comfortable with me doing and knowing that they could paint over it obviously and they have since but um, I mean I think I in answering your question really it's it's a matter of um, fostering what whatever it is that your child um, is passionate about whether it's golf or whether it's tennis or whether it's art or you know crafts or, or mask making or or whatever it may be, so I, th I think that's the most important part. What was that transition like, going from banking into fashion? What <laughs> obstacles did you come? Any heroes that came into the store to help? Um, it was it was a major transition. I, I spent um, about ten, z 10 years of my life after university traveling the world, so um, that really opened up my eyes in terms of understanding culture, understanding um, the different types of people uh, that are around the world as well as kind of figuring out what it was that I thought that I should be doing. Um, and I came back and I got into banking just because I thought it was something safe and it was actually utilizing what I did in school. Um, I, I came to a point where I figured that it would just, it wasn't satisfying me anymore. Um, and I was looking and really searching for that passion that I had before that I could wake up every morning and be happy to what I was doing. So um, a man who is very dear to my heart and was really my mentor um, took me on under his wing 
with literally no experience in the fashion industry, but he took me on because I had, um, you know, I had that worldly travel experience, and I understood um, how the world kind of turned. And and he took me under his wing, and and he kind of showed me the ropes um, for the past four years, really. And um, he was kind of my hero in in my influencer in in finding what it was truly that I wanted to do. Can you can you speak to what you're doing now that makes fashion a bit more accessible? Sure. Um, what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to build is uh, I'm really trying to um, disrupt the way the retail environment works at the moment. Um, it's a broken system. It, it's something that has uh, been identified as a broken system just recently, really. Yeah. And uh, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to create a cohabitive and, and cooperative environment so that um, instead of the big bad, I, I won't name uh, retailers, but um, certain retailers uh, who kind of call the shots, uh, we want to create a, a, a co-op of smaller independent brands that can work together. Um, and by brands, I mean whether it's a, a tech brand or whether it's a fashion brand or whether it's um, or whether it's a group of artists or whether it's a single artist um, that can work together. Um, and and kind of uh, pool their resources to uh, to kind of overcome the big bad uh, big yeah. brother if you if you will so the monopolies basically is, is how do we get rid of those monopolies and provide right. opportunities for new businesses right. that are, are in the field exactly it's interesting what you were saying earlier about art used to be on the street so when we were talking about, well, why is it so elitist and why is it that every time you want to go to the opera or ballet, do you have to pay big pri you know, prices for it? Um, it was interesting that you, you were saying, but that's how it used to be, is on the street. So, and I'm thinking about India for myself and I'm thinking, yeah, you know what, it is. So you have all these artists that are on the street. You have the architecture, which is all about artists. You have the festivals and the ceremonies, but I think more than that, it's available to you because people, the vendors that are selling things that are all handmade yeah. are artists, mm -hmm. right? And, and coming to you, Peter, mm -hmm. it's interesting that um, Canada, with the weather that it has, um, how much of your time can you actually spend on the streets as a street artist doing the stuff you do? And is that why, is it more conducive to go into Europe? Is that why the travels possibly um, I know when we travel, it's always outdoors. You know, the musicians and the mime, and, uh, and I know you've been and you've traveled a lot and you've done a lot of this work. Yeah. Do you think the weather is a huge um, barrier for you to be able to do the street art and access to arts? It, um, on a national level, like if you're going to Halifax, where I'm going this summer, uh, they have a small window of two months, yeah. you yeah. know, so, uh, and that's when the tourists are out, when the people come out. And they are so full of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's nothing more special than performing for Canadians that are super happy to get out of their house. So <laughs> places like Newfoundland and uh, uh, Halifax, um, it's incredible. You know, now when you get to southwestern Ontario, the, the window of, of street time is greater. You can start as soon as May, and you, you can finish as, as late as uh, end of October. Mm -hmm. um, so that window is pretty good. Um, I perform um, uh, as a, a, a street performer. I I felt that I love the idea of pioneering new venues. So I'll go to a flea market and I will work the uh, the management there and mm -hmm. show them the benefits of bringing some entertainment culture mm -hmm. to the uh, not just shopping and uh, it'll keep them there longer it'll be interesting it'll be a tradition try to so I'm trying to create traditions of performance all around the city mm -hmm. and I have done so at Pickering Market um, uh, Bromley so at Bromley Center I almost started a program there last Christmas but then I got invited to a, by another mall so I went there but I've been doing it hopscotch trying to develop new pioneering areas where street can so performing can happen. So your key message in terms of how do we make art so it's accessible? Key message. Um, I would say businesses open up your front doors. 
uh, open up your patio areas where we can uh, and invite Use artists to come perform. Uh, make space available. Thank you. Think of it. And Sean? Um, I believe that a cohabitive and cooperative environments is one of the biggest things that we can do. And on the art side of things, I think public art is so very important. It's in, it's in the eye of, of, of the public and it's easily accessible. It's not, it doesn't cost you six fifty to for admission. Um, and I really think that it starts with educating and fostering that passion um, for the youth. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Um, you've certainly, it's, it's certainly encouraged a lot of dialogue um, in terms of where we go from here uh, and how we can make access to arts possible for us um, and the things that we need to do in order to bring about the change. Um, so we'll start with policy and we'll go into being motivated and inspired by you and keep things going out in the community and attending all the functions that you have. Um, and the events that you create. Um, so both of you now are going to be, and you already are, but role models uh, and mentors uh, for a lot of young people. And uh, we've got to keep reaching out to that. So we'll post some of your uh, information and maybe your websites or uh, information where people can connect with you. And uh, we've got to keep going for another 40 seconds <laughs> before I turn it over to Dave. <laughs> so over to you, Dave. <laughs> Thanks very much, Randy. Let's see uh, how long I can ad lib for. Just kidding, folks. As we can see, the access to arts and funding cannot solely reside on institutional change. Governments cannot necessarily carry this on their own. But as you've seen throughout this episode, the community has been building in the region of Peel to provide access to the arts for both members of the community, young and old. And it's important to remember to reach out to places like Night and Day Studio or Lab B who are currently working so diligently to provide these venues to give people access that they need. On behalf of the hosts here, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Towards Social Justice. Follow us on Twitter for all our updates, at Towards SJ. Again, I'm David Barnwell and keep having those courageous conversations.